mainly believed in social synergy and evolutionary leadership and visionary change. So we said this is one concrete way that we can honor her memory is by continuing the work that she started last year. Um, so that's why we're so grateful to our two friends who are supporting Emily's vision. They are, they are living their spiritual message. That's who they are. They walk their talk with everybody they meet. We're just very privileged to have them with us tonight. So thank you. Thank you. to be here tonight uh, in Emily's home, in Lynn's home. And I'm especially honored to be here sharing this with my, my dear brother. You know I love this man. We've known each other almost 20 years now. We've toured all over the world together. We've toured all through Europe on a train. We've been to Australia when our producer's mother passed during the tour. And, and we toured ourselves. In a Volkswagen. In a Volkswagen in the, in the outback with kangaroos. <laughs> so we've known, we've known one another for a long time. and. Um, Rarely do I co-present with anyone. I always say yes with Bruce because it makes sense. Because um, because of the way our, our work has has merged uh, and even deeper, I think over, over the years. So I, I know. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, just, uh, Fifteen minutes. Okay. I'm going to talk really fast. I'm going to leave all the vowels out. Biblical Hebrew and easy to read. No, this, uh, Diane asked, asked me to say a few, there, a few words uh, about our, our work in general and, and specifically some of the issues I think that uh, draw you all together. I'm honored to be here with you as well because this is community, and community is so key in where we're going in the world right now. We have, uh, Bruce and I have had the opportunity to, to be all over the world, not just in, in some of the biggest cities on the planet, but in some of the most isolated, remote, magnificent, beautiful, pristine places remaining in the world where our indigenous ancestors are witnessing a shift in the world that they have expected for a very long time. And many of them have done their best to tell the Western world that this shift was coming in a language that the Western world wasn't always quick to embrace. So from the indigenous and the ancient perspective, the changes that our world is going through to them, uh, they've made room for it in their lives because they allow for us to have a deep, nurturing relationship with cycles of time and cycles of nature, and that includes Earth and the Earth uh, changes the Earth goes through. There's a dichotomy in the Western world, in the big cities and the large organizations, and we're both trained as scientists. Our, our degrees are in the sciences, the hard sciences. Science doesn't make room for the kinds of changes that our world is going through, and, and Western world doesn't allow for the cycles of change that we're witnessing right now. So when the world begins to shift and the things that we have grown accustomed to, the ways that we've come to master our lives and our world, when those things begin to change to the Western world, it means something is wrong. And they identify it as a time of crisis. So you are hearing in the Western media that we are living a time of crisis. From the indigenous perspective, uh, it is a time of change with the opportunity of transformation. And the question is, as we meet the, the change that we're seeing, will we allow for the transformation that, that is at hand? And we're making that, that choice right now. So one of the, the places where I find this so interesting, the indigenous perspective, 5,000 years of indigenous wisdom, uh, it's not scientific, but it is accurate. Uh, and it helps us to understand our relationship to ourselves, to life, to the earth, to the past, and the way we work together. Science is only about 300 years old, and the scientific perspective that you and I are all steeped in, and even if, we, even if we've done so much work on our own uh, to, to transcend our Western culture, Western traditions, we have all been steeped in, in the belief that we live in a world of struggle, uh, a world of competition, survival of the strongest. We've all been told when we were kids, we live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Uh, and these ideas, they're not that we talk about them every day, but they're so much a part of our culture because science began to, to disseminate them. In the 1800s, early 1900s, our civilization was based upon these, these ideas of struggle, competition, survival of the strongest. The economic system that's breaking right now in the world is based upon survival of the strongest. The way we're trying to solve our problems in the Middle East, the way we're trying to solve the problems of uh, uh, diminishing resources. And 
the old thinking is no longer working. And the reason it's no longer working is because those beliefs are based, we now know, in principles that are false, false assumptions of science. Both Bruce and I talk about new discoveries. So these aren't our opinions or hypotheses or theories. It's peer-reviewed science has now overturned uh, 300 years of, of traditional scientific thinking and is telling us that nature is actually based upon a model of, of cooperation and, and what biologists call mutual aid. And we all know competition happens, but it's, it's not the rule, it's the exception. <clears throat> we now understand that life, uh, life is not a, a random event. It is something very, very specific that happened and the DNA is telling us this, that human life uh, is not a random event. The fossil evidence is telling us this. Civilization is older than 5,000 years old. The archaeology is pushing advanced civilization, technologically advanced civilizations back into the end of the last ice age 13,000 years ago. All of this changes the way we think of ourselves and it changes the way we go about solving our problems. So that's the good news. The flip side is there is a, a reluctance and in some cases uh, a staunch resistance to sharing this in the mainstream. So you're not seeing this in mainstream television, mainstream documentaries. Public classrooms and textbooks are not sharing the new discoveries. So we have an entire generation of young people now who are being steeped in the false assumptions of science that have led to the problems that we're facing right now. And they're being asked to solve them through the same thinking. So my question that I've asked is how can we possibly meet the the issues of our time, if we're not even honest about the issues. And we can talk about this as much as you like, but I, I'm going to share with you right now, you are not being given the facts of climate change. It's not what you're being told publicly. You're not being given the facts of the global economic meltdown. It's not being shared. We have, I was in Zurich, and in Zurich it's common, common conversation. You get to this country, people don't even know uh, about what, what is actually happening at the root of the, the financial system of the world. Um, so it is a fact that we're living what is now being called a time of extremes. It doesn't mean they're bad things or good things, it just means they're really big things. And the thinking of the past will no longer work to solve the problems and the issues. And that opens the door to new possibilities, that's why we're speaking uh, and sharing at the, at the UN tomorrow. And one of the keys for me and, and one of the principles, this is where it all comes together, is uh, in the indigenous peoples that I've spent time with, the women and the men, the families, the elders. <laughs> oh yeah, your cell phones and pages. <laughs> the, the key, the key for these people, they had been through times in their history very similar to what we're living through in ours right now. And if we have the wisdom, we can learn from what worked with them and what didn't, and the things that worked, do a lot of, and what didn't work, stop doing it in our time. Resilience is the word that comes up again and again. And when you talk about resilience in, in the Western world, the modern world, there's a sense that resilience, and it's actually defined as the ability to return to a normal functioning or the ability to spring back after uh, a traumatic event on a, a personal a community uh, or a national or global event has happened. And that kind of resilience, we, we're all familiar with it, it's worked in the past, we've experienced it in our lives. There's an expanded form of resilience, and the Stockholm Resilience uh, Center is, is pioneering a lot of the work with this. It's a way of thinking and living that makes room for the extremes in our lives each day so we can actually thrive in the midst of the extremes because we have allowed for them in the thinking and living rather than trying to live our lives as if this change is not happening and then acting surprised when something goes wrong, like a severe weather event. Uh, we're going to see the severe weather events because we are in a cycle of climate change that's here to stay at least for our, our lifetimes. Um, as a geologist, I can tell you the ice cores of Antarctica, I have no political agenda so, uh, and I have no academic uh, uh, credibility to defend. I can tell you exactly what those ice cores are saying to us, and it's not what we're hearing on mainstream. What you're hearing on the mainstream is a negotiated story, and, and they're quick to tell you that. It's a negotiated story that's left out some of the vital details. So the good news is that we already have all the solutions. For every major 
issue, all the big problems in our world, we have the solutions. And Bruce and I talk about this all the time. The greatest crisis I think that we're facing is a crisis in thinking that has yet to make room in our lives for the solutions that already exist in the world. We have enough food to feed every mouth of every human on this planet. Right now, there's no shortage. The, the, the food is not the problem. It's the politics and the thinking that won't allow it to get in the right places. We, we have forms of energy that produce no greenhouse gases that are inexpensive, abundant, that could fuel every home of every human on the face of the earth that chooses to have power in their home. It's not the technology that's the problem. I, I think back, and I know most of you in this room are old enough to remember this. I remember John F. Kennedy gave a speech that changed my life when I was young. In 32 words, he changed the course of human history. And, and what he said is, we choose before the end of this decade to place a man on the moon and bring him back safely. That's, I'm paraphrasing. And it happened even before the end of the decade. And people say to me all the time, they say, how did that happen so fast? How did they, how they develop the algorithms for the trajectory and, and how they learned to build spacesuits and the packages of Tang that all the astronauts <laughs> were bringing? How did they do that so quickly and implement it in 10 years? And, and the answer is why I'm sharing this story right now. The technology already existed. No one in a position of authority and power had ever given a mandate for that technology to become a focus and accomplish a goal. And when then President John Kennedy, when he made that statement, it was the mandate unprecedented for the, the military complex, the civilian uh, uh, academic university complex, uh, for corporations to free the money, banks to free the money, uh, in a way that had never been done before. And the reason I'm saying is because that's precisely where we are right now. It's not about going to the moon, but it's about alleviating the suffering of people in the world who don't have the luxury to be in a salon like we are because they're struggling for their life tonight. But the key for those people is that we have the ability right now to implement a, a transformation. Uh, it can be done quickly or it can be done gradually over a long period of time, but no one in the position of authority and power has yet to make it a priority in this world. And I'm, I'm not saying it has to be a president of the United States. I'm simply saying that the fact is, if it were a priority, we have what we need to do that now. Resilience is the key and community and cooperation uh, that we now know is the, the, the essence of, of nature itself. Nature shows us this model, and I know Bruce shares this so eloquently. When he looks at the cells, we want to see how the world works. Bruce will tell you all about the cells. So we're learning now. And, I, and People ask me all the time, they say, Greg, you know, you think we made some big mistakes. I think it's more useful, personally, to think of ourselves as on this huge learning curve. And I think we've made choices in the past based upon what we knew, and they worked so well, they got us here. We're here now, so they worked. But now the world changed, and this is, this is the last thing I'm going to say. The world changed, and no one has told us. There's been no special on BBC or CNN or the New York Times or some glossy magazine. And people all over the world now are clinging to an idea of the way things used to be and the way that they used to work in the world that used to be. And they're waiting for that world to return. And those are the people that are hurting and struggling right now because that world is gone. And because it has not been acknowledged in the mainstream, and this is something I think we all can, and Alan, you help with, with your films, doing this beautifully. Because it hasn't been acknowledged, we have never had the opportunity to mourn the passing of a way of life that we all have mastered, and in the same generation that we mastered it, it has disappeared. And in the mourning and letting go, that is what frees us to embrace the new world, beautiful world, powerful world that's emerging. But unless that can be shared on a, a broad, general, <coughs> mainstream basis with everyday people, they're still thinking that we're in a temporary world that's struggling and they're waiting for the normal to come back and they put their lives on hold. They're not, I know people, I tell this story in one of my books, they're not having babies, they're not buying homes, they're not sending their kids to school because they're waiting for things to get back to normal. And it's a normal that can never happen because that world is gone and no one told us. So our 
our prayer individually and, and collectively and through the work that uh, Source of Synergy Foundation, Synergy is what I'm all about. That's why it's such a perfect name mm -hmm. for your organization. And the Source of Synergy Foundation, I think, is, is a beautiful example of the kind of organization that is emerging that transcends the polarities and the differences. Uh, E.O. Wilson says this beautifully. He says, the world from this point forward is going to be run by synthesizers people that can take a lot of information from a lot of different places and make the right decisions at the right time and think critically about it. So it's no longer enough to be an expert in one field because the world doesn't know those boundaries. But we're being asked to draw from everything that we know and to synergize it in a way that we've never done before. So as the world changes in ways that we're not used to, faster than we've ever seen, our lives are changing as well and we're all learning together. And this is where I think the, the synergy of the ancient and the indigenous wisdom married with the best science of today through community resilience is the key to bring us full circle. And that's where I'm going to stop right now. Thank you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me give a warm welcome. Give it up for Bruce. Uh, I love this man, obviously. <laughs> but what you don't know is he was a rock promoter, and I was a musician long before we were ever authors, so this whole gig doesn't work out for us. <laughs> going back to the music business, so, just, just so you know. <laughs> uh, I so appreciate that. I also appreciate, uh, number one, um, being in, the, in this environment of uh, Len and Emily says, infused and permeated with an energy of love which we all know and we all feel and that's really important because our love does permeate a structure and it does change the world and it's a physical reality which I uh, am new to in my life in the last 20 years now uh, but what I'd like to talk about is that everything is on schedule <laughs> the world is falling apart right on schedule <laughs> And we have to understand this, uh, that we've had a belief about what evolution was predicated on, and we always uh, focus on the nature of genes, that we would see that genes were controlling the traits and characters, and as you go up the evolutionary scale, there's going to be more genes and more, more character and traits evolving <coughs> from these genes, and it turns out this is totally false. The whole idea about genes has been a, a totally misunderstood uh, belief system that we bought into, that genes control life. Genes control nothing. Genes are blueprints. That's exactly what they are. And why that's relevant is we've been focusing on the blueprints and giving them self-realization, that they make a decision, a gene turns on and a gene turns off. And it turns out this is totally false. And the, the problem with this belief system, because it permeates our structure of the world, is that people perceive themselves as victims of a world because their genes are controlling them and they can't control their genes, according to that belief. <coughs> I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time years ago. I was cloning stem cells about 46 years ago. There was just a handful of us in the entire world that even knew what the hell a stem cell was. I did this study, and I, it's just so brief and so, so profoundly important, I just want to say what it represented. I would isolate one stem cell, uh, which is an embryonic cell. Stem cells are embryo cells. Uh, uh, the moment before you're born, I could say, here's an embryo cell, and then a moment after you're born, I look at the same cell and say, now it's called a stem cell. So, that's what it represents, and the reason we have stem cells, and all of you have them because you are here, uh, is the fact that every day we lose, uh, as Carl Sagan would say, hundreds of billions of cells uh, are dying every day, and we have to replace them, so we are growing every day of our lives by necessity. If you stop growing, uh, if you stop the stem cells, you'll die right off. That's what it's going to be about. So the point about is we all have these stem cells, we have these embryonic cells. I had isolate one cell, put it in the Petri dish by itself. It divides every 10 or 12 hours. So after uh, a week, I have about 50,000 cells in the Petri dish, but they all came from the same parent. So I have 50,000 genetically identical cells in the Petri dish. The experiment that I did is just mind-boggling because it was so simple and profound is I would take <coughs> cells out of the master dish and put it into another Petri dish and change the environment, the culture environment. Uh, cells live in the equivalent of a synthetic blood that we make in a laboratory called culture medium. And by changing some of the composition of that culture medium, I put these cells into from the main dish into this dish and the cells form muscle. And I go back to the very same dish of stem cells, put them into a second Petri dish with another environment, and they form bone. 
and I go back to the very same dish and put a, uh, cells into a third petri dish with a different environment and uh, they form fat cells. Well, you're left with a very important and very profound question, what controls the fate of the cells? The answer, first of all, they were all genetically identical, so you can't say invoke the genes as controlling this. It was the environment. My work on trying to understand how the environmental signals lead to the control of genes, which is now a new science uh, in the last, since 1990, I saw this in 1967 and wrote about it, but it took 1990 until science recognized a new branch of science called epigenetics. And it's the most profound revolution in the world for a very important reason. When I say genetic control, it literally means control by genes. That's the belief, oh, genes cause this and genes cause that, which is false. Epigenetic uh, sounds like the same thing, epigenetic control, but epi is the entire revolution that this planet will pivot upon. For the reason is this, the prefix epi means above. So when I say epigenetic control, then I'm literally saying control above the genes. Well, that becomes important because when we always look for control, we always go to the genes. Now we're saying, well, where's the control above the gene? It led me to an understanding of what is called the cell membrane, the skin of the cell. And the relevance is that the skin of the cell is an information processor. It reads the environment and it sends signals into the cell and to the genes to control the biology of the genes to live in an environment that's always changing. So the membrane is, is the nervous system of the cell. Uh, just to let you know, in the development of a human, the outer layer of the embryo is called ectoderm, it's a skin. The skin gives rise only to two things in humans, skin and nervous system. So like the cell, our nervous system comes from this outer layer. Well, the significance about that, it led me to an understanding of how the cell worked and all that stuff, but it also led me to understand this. Evolution is, the way we perceive it, is a, a scale of increasing awareness. And so we make a whole evolutionary list. Oh, we start with bacteria, and then there are amoebas, and then there's worms, and then you get the, you know, fish, amphibians, fro you know, reptiles, birds, mammals, blah, blah, blah. And we see this as one continuous process with imperceptible changes over billions of years. Well, that is a total misperception. The genes do not rec uh, represent our evolution for a simple reason. The number of genes in a human, which is now, I think, 22,333, uh, is essentially the same number of genes in one of the smallest organisms we work with in a genetics lab, a worm with 1,200 cells has the same number of genes. So basically, the number of genes did not give us the big difference, okay? Uh, so basically we were looking at the wrong thing. It turns out it's the membrane of the cell where intelligence comes from. And the significance of that is the most primitive organisms on this planet are called bacteria. And they are the smallest little cells and they have like a, a capsule. They look like little medicine capsules, a lot of them. And the problem with that is the membrane of a bacterium can only get so big because uh, once it reaches, you know, the, the maximum inside this capsule, that's all you can have. So evolution started by creating the bacteria and then multiplying them and creating all different kinds of versions of bacteria, but they were all still limited by the ability, their inability to expand their membrane. So by definition, evolution stopped. It couldn't make a smarter bacterium. There was no way it could happen. But evolution saw another way, and the other way was called community that bacteria started to live in community with each other and put a membrane around themselves. And so they had a closed world and the bacteria exchanged jobs because there were different kinds of bacteria and they all exchanged, they exchanged their DNA and they lived in a community. So the community of bacteria called a biofilm is the precursor of the next level of evolution which is called the amoeba. The amoeba is a community of bacteria living under a skin, okay? Well, then the next level of evolution is what? make more and more amoebas with variations on a theme. An amoeba has thousands of times more surface area membrane than a bacterium does. So an amoeba is thousands of times more intelligent in its ability. Then comes an interesting part. So the next level, and this is the first uh, billion years was basically bacteria, and then the amoebas came in at the end, and then the next billion years or so, billion and a half years, was variations on all the amoebas, which are what? Communities of bacteria with a membrane around them. Well, what happened was this. The amoeba got to a size where it can't get any bigger. Simple reason. It's like a balloon. When you put water in the balloon, you get a little bit of water, we can throw the balloon all around the room. But if you put too much water in a balloon, try to throw it, the membrane rips. Well, the membrane rips, the cell dies. What's the point? Even amoebas reached a maximum size 
where they couldn't create any more membrane and still be viable, evolution stopped for the second time. And then what happened was the next level of evolution was amoebas got together and formed a community and put a skin around them. And so we, by definition, are a community of 50 trillion amoebas underneath our skin. And they make, they make the society because the, the amoebas are the living element. We, by definition, are a community. I'm a community. I'm not an individual. I got 50 trillion citizens living <laughs> inside. And the relevance about this is very important. There's no new function in the human that's not already present in the amoeba. Amoebas have a respiratory, digestive, excretory, nervous system, neuroendocrine system, reproductive system. Amoebas have an immune system, okay? Relevance is this. A human is the highest level of that community of amoebas and reached its maximum ability for its brain. Uh, and all the surface area of the brain with all the folds and gyri and so forth, that's increasing the surface area, but it maximized. The human represents another endpoint. And then what happens at an end point is the individuals come together in a community and form the next higher organization. The evolution that we are facing right now is the evolution of the next higher level of organization where every human is a cell in the body of a super organism that's forming uh, and that super organism is called humanity. So we are coming together to create a new structure. The falling apart of the existing structure is a necessary requirement before the new structure can be built. We can't build it on the faulty uh, you know, foundation that Greg mentioned and both of us have it in our books. It's a faulty foundation. You can't survive with this way we've been living. So the falling apart of society is a necessary step in the evolution. Rather than to be feared, it should be welcomed is because if we don't do it, the inevitable end is coming because science has already told us we're going extinct. And, uh, and that's because of the way we live with each other and the way we live with the planet has been destructive of the system. So we're on the edge of a system falling apart and a new system beginning. Well, this is where you come in very critically into this because uh, it's a formation of a community. Out of what and from who? Where's it coming from? We've got seven billion people. And so to give the analogy, which you've heard, but now it really makes sense if you understand it, um, a, a cell is a miniature human, as I said, it has all the functions. So I say, go inside a, the body of a caterpillar, and it's got, let's say, seven billion cells in there, and they're all working together. Some of them, are, they have different jobs. That, it's really important. Some do muscle work, some do digestion work, some do blood system work. They have jobs. They all work together in a community. And the, as the caterpillar is growing, the environment and the economy is booming. You know, it's growing, it's everything, everybody's happy, everybody's working, everything's cool. And then it reaches a plateau where the caterpillar can't grow anymore. And that is a, a, a problem, a finite problem, because all these cells that were doing jobs like moving the caterpillar around or digesting the food, well, we're not moving, we're not even taking in any food. What does it mean? The system starts falling apart. Many of the cells actually commit suicide, which in biology is called apoptosis. And there's a complete dissolution of the structure. But what's most important about that is in the midst of this dissolution, there are specialized stem cells called imaginal cells. And imaginal cells carry a vision of a different world. They're genetically identical to all the other cells, but they carry a different vision of a world. What they do is they get in among all the cells that are falling apart and help them organize into the next higher structure, which is the butterfly. So the relevance of you being in this room, number one, you are the cultural creatives that represent the imaginal cells. It's your influence in the world that can help shape the new structure of the community that must evolve. If we don't form this, then it's a choice. <laughs> we may not make it. We've been here before, and we didn't make it, but this is an opportunity. If we don't change, then science's is prediction of extinction is actually real and looming. And yet there is this great chance, because the Internet, which uh, represents the development of the nervous system of humanity. It connects seven billion cells into one living organism. And we have a new population called the millennial generation. The most important part about that millennial generation is they're not part of the structure. They bitch and complain, and rightfully so, that they can't seem to get started in this world, but they don't realize not getting started is the primary step of the next evolution for a simple reason. They don't, you tell a 20-something a, a person that the stock market is going to crash, and they go, like I own a stock, right? I don't really care. And now why that becomes important is they don't have a hold on the structure as it is. 
and there's now greater than 50% of them, which means less than 50% of the population is holding on to say, keep the structure the way it is, but they're getting, to, you know, the population is diminishing. This is the foundation of what will cause a precipitation of the existing structure because they're not connected to it. And they come from a global vision. They're connected by internet to a global world. The issues that, if I, you know, politically said like Republicans in the case of, uh, you know, the anger things that they have and their, and their, their things, they, they were completely taken back by the population not following them, but not recognizing the young people are, they don't have a, a thing with race or with sex and all that kind of stuff, which are those other issues. They're global. And so their vision is really where the new vision is coming from. The falling down of the old one is necessary. So this is really exciting because it says we are on the verge of making something new. And in addition to that, there'll be one other factor besides the fact that, well, there's two factors for the evolution. I'll just say it very quickly, two factors. Number one, we are not victims of our health. Ninety-some percent of ill health on this planet is now found to do totally to stress. It is not due to the biological malfunctioning that in fact less than 5% of the population can even legitimately claim that their genetics are interfering with their life. So that means 95% of the people have a perfectly adequate genetic system, okay? We've been programmed to be victims, and the fact is, no, we are the ones that change the environment or perception of the environment, and since the environment that controls the cells, it doesn't make a difference if the cell's in a plastic dish or a skin-covered dish. It still responds to the environment. Our mind creates the chemistry, which is the foundation of the culture medium called blood. Your thoughts release different chemicals into the blood, and just as I change the culture medium in one dish to another dish, I change the fate of the cells. As you change your mind and change your perception, you change your own biology and genetics, which means you're all powerful, but you don't believe it because there's nobody to support it. This becomes uh, really critical, and the other part is this, we've all been programmed. And this is the hardship that we face. And there's a movie called The Matrix. You may have seen the, uh, people look for it in the science fiction part of the video store. It's actually a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason is simply this. We have been given the choice of take the blue pill and go back into the program, or take the red pill and get out of the program. They never really said what would happen if you got out of the program. And all of us have been programmed last trimester of pregnancy, first seven years, is download. And the reason for the download is this. You cannot be conscious if you don't have data. In other words, I buy you a new iPod, you take it out of the box, I say push play, play is the create the playlist, create it, you know, conscious, let's say. Uh, I say push the play on the new iPod, and nothing happens. So, I, well, why not? And the answer is you didn't put any programs to play from. First seven years, nature designed the download. The download is uh, a brain state of theta as a predominant brain state, which is hypnosis. So that children observe everyone around them and download the behavior without conscious filtering or conscious interpretation. It's just a recording. What their fathers, their mothers, their family, culture is doing is a download. And these <coughs> then become the foundation of the database. Now, the issue is the conscious mind is us our spiritual, our source, our, who we are. We, we are in the conscious mind. There's an entity in there. That's us, okay? And the conscious mind is the creative mind. The conscious mind has wishes, desires, and aspirations. The subconscious mind is the habitual mind. It just plays the programs that we got. Well, the issue is why don't our lives match our wishes and our desires, and science has answered that simply by the fact that it recognizes that we only operate 5% of the time from our conscious minds. That means 95% of your life is coming from the subconscious programs, which means the behaviors that you represent 95% of the time are actually not even yours fundamentally. They were downloaded from other people. And as a result, we're not living the lives that we want to live. And we don't see it, and that's where the whole monkey wrench goes in the system. As I say in my lectures very quickly, I hope I'm, give me a minute here, i try to get to the end of this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I say, go back to a time in your life. I know you had a friend. You were very close to your friend. You knew your friend's behavior very, very well. <coughs> and you happen to know your friend's parent. And at one point, you see your friend has some of the same behavior as their parent. So you volunteer something like, hey, you know, Bill, you're just like your dad. And then you back away from Bill, who goes totally ballistic and says, how can you compare me to my dad? And most people are totally familiar with this. And I say, but this is a profound story. Everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. The only one who doesn't see it is Bill. And there's a reason, scientifically, 
the conscious mind is thinking 95% of the time, and when it's thinking, by definition, it's not being mindful or paying attention. And as a result, the default shifts into the subconscious behavior. So now you're playing behavior that you don't see and comes from other people and sabotages ourselves, okay? So the programming is really where the problems come from. And the cultural programming is passed down the first seven years unconsciously from generation to generation to generation, which presets your, your cancer. Uh, children who are adopted into a family that has a lineage of cancer, the adopted child will get the can same family cancer as much as any sibling would, but they came from totally different genetics. It's not the genes that did this, okay? Um, go back very quickly and I'll just close it out because there's some interesting part about the story of the matrix. It says, take the red pill and get out of the programming. And I would say, well, what would happen if you didn't go in, if, if you stopped operating from your programming, if you stayed mindful <laughs> right now and stopped operating from the program, I'll tell you what happened because you've experienced it already in your life. If you ever fell in love, head over mm -hmm. heels in love with somebody, this was the one time in your life where you don't uh, default to the subconscious program. It's the beginning part of love. It's called the honeymoon. Three things are very important about it. Number one, you're extremely healthy. And the reason is love causes brain secretions in the culture medium that give health and to the cells. People glow. They have tremendous energy when they fall in love. I always joke that they make love for days without stopping for food or sleep. They got so much energy. Uh, and I also come to this most important conclusion. When you ask people who are in that state of what I call the honeymoon effect about life on this planet, to them at that moment it's heaven on earth. It's heaven on earth. And the fact was, well, that was not an accident or, or a coincidence. They created it from what? Conscious mind, wishes, desires, and aspirations then there's a tendency to lose it and it falls apart. And the reason is, well, why did it fall apart? And the answer is, when life gets busy, you start to think. <laughs> and the moment you start thinking, you default to the programs that you got from your parents and your community. Well, those behaviors were never part of the honeymoon. So when they're introduced, usually it's a shock to the other person to see that behavior show up. Uh, and, and, and this is where that, I love the phrase, who are you comes out to, to their partner. Uh, and, and the fact is, then you have to go back to Bill's story. Bill didn't see he was playing the behavior, so he has no idea he has that behavior. So when a couple start to argue over the behavior that shows up and one doesn't even know they played the behavior, that's where the thing starts falling apart and compromises start coming in. Well, I accept that crummy behavior because we had this great honeymoon part. That was really good. But then another compromise and another compromise. And every time you compromise, the honeymoon disappears quick, piece by piece by piece until you say, no more compromises, relationship over. And then you stand there thinking, how did something so wonderful turn into this? And the answer was, it was wonderful when you operated from your creative conscious mind and were mindful. And you lost it when the programs kicked in. So the world we're facing today is in a conclusion cosmic joke, if I would really look at it the way I'd love to see it, is that we've been programmed to believe that we die and then we go to heaven. My perception is a little different. I think we're born into heaven. And this is where we come to create. This is where we come to have experiences. When we die, we carry those with us, but not the opportunity to make more creations, because this is a, a virtual reality suit that, uh, I, as I was saying earlier, when, uh, when I wasn't spiritual. I, was, I had nothing to do with spirituality. I was doing genetics and mo you know, molecules, all these things. And, and then I saw the nature of the spirituality, and it was a moment of my whole life changed. And the moment was when I asked myself, when I owned all of a sudden that I have a spiritual part to me and a physical part, and I asked myself, why well, have both? And the cells, the cells answered the question with a question. Uh, I asked, why have both a spirit and a body? And the cells said this to me, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? And all of a sudden I realized that's a short way of saying all the experiences, the emotions, the, what you see with your eyes, what you hear with your ears, what you taste, with your, what you feel and touch and smell, all of that is derived from this cellular machine that converts the sensations of our world into vibration and the brain sends the vibration <coughs> back to source. And I realized biggest mistake in my whole life because as males, what was the programming? Males were programmed not to be sensitive. 
because if we were sensitive, then we were sissies. So we got to the point of how insensitive we can be. Well, hit me and see if I cry. That's the you know that was the test. You know, I'm so insensitive you can hit me. And then, of course, we grew up in a world with all these women with all their sensitivity because that's allowed. And they look at us going, how come they're so damn insensitive? <laughs> and it's the programming. And the fact is I've wasted a lot of my life realizing that our business on this planet is experiential and to go and be creative and to, and to, to manifest experiences you want to carry with you. And the group of uh, uh, the Synergy Foundation, you people all here, are creating experiences in this world and you're at a level of your experiential creations are capable of influencing a large number of other people because that's how it's going to spread. As people let go of the programming and move into personal creativity, we all create heaven on earth when we're in love. If we got rid of the program, by then definition, everyone would be manifesting their version of heaven on earth. And I think this is the destination that we're moving into, but we're, the old structure is in a state of collapse with new thinking. And this is what Greg and I emphasize about the new science, the new thinking that shapes the way we live. So we are definitely on the verge of the greatest possible step of human evolution ever, the coming together of a unity called humanity. And the synergy of seven billion people coming together in the world of science leads to something called emergence. And emergence is things we couldn't even imagine right at this minute, when that many people come together, will pop out of our world. So there's a world that's so far beyond even our imagination at this moment, just looming <coughs> on the horizon. And as Greg said, all the answers that we need are here, and when this comes together, it will, it will completely turn this planet into heaven on earth, which it rightfully is. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to congratulate both of our speakers for giving the bottom line, which is positive thinking and strategy. And both of you are excellent models of what teamwork must be about in going beyond this mm -hmm. negativity, this electronic seance we see through the multimedia of seeing only negative situations rather than positive answers that are here with us. In, in essence, we are the cosmic DNA waking up to really mm -hmm. live the blueprint of life as yeah. co-creators. We want to thank both of you for all of the work that you've done worldwide to make really Mother Earth as our schoolhouse of the future. Thank you. 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 Thank you.